بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم ربي شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحد الأقدة من لساني يرقه قولي اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل حزن إذا شدت سهلا فوض أمري إليك اللهم ربنا زدنا علما يا أرحم الراحمين Okay, so this is the beginning of our Sira series. Um, as I mentioned last night, pretty much almost no one uh, was here except for a few of you. Um, this is not going to be your normal Sira class. Um, I'm almost 100% positive that what I'm going to teach you over the next uh, weeks is something that they probably don't teach in any masjid. Um, and that's because it's not based on like a classical book it's not based on um you know something that you can go um uh learn at an islamic institution some of these things might be mentioned in islamic institutions but a lot of this is uh information that i've gathered together over the years that i consider to be vitally important to increasing my own personal faith in the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so my goal for you all is to really just skyrocket your Iman. Um, that's really what I hope this, uh, these few weeks will do for all of you, is really just make you have absolute yaqeen that what you are doing, practicing Islam, is exactly what you should be doing. Um, now, the, this will be in three separate class, uh, three separate uh, um, Maybe you call them modules. This first module is where we're going to look at before the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu So it's called Signs of Islam and Previous Scriptures. It's going to take at least two sessions to get through this. And then the next module will be um, conveying the signs of Allah. We're going to be looking at um, experiences in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu So once he's born in his life, and we're going to take examples from his sirah, and we're going to show how they prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that not only was he sincere about calling people to Islam, but he could not in any way be um, have any sort of uh, bad intentions behind what he was doing. And then finally, the last module is a little bit of an experiment on my part because um, I haven't given this class very often. So I'm going to be trying it out with you all, but it's going to be looking at after the Prophet Sallallahu So a lot of the prophecies he made about the future and how we can interpret them today and see that in fact everything he said came true. So tonight's um, module and all of the modules really you will benefit greatly if you understand Arabic. Um, but at the least if you know the alphabet you can read it, you can write it. Um, if you know the alphabet you'll probably uh, not struggle too much with this first module. If you don't even know the Arabic alphabet this first module is going to be a little bit difficult for you because I'm going to be asking you all to learn a new alphabet. But if you already know the first one, the second one's a lot easier to learn. So without further ado, we'll kick into this presentation. Bismillah. Okay. An interesting ayah in the Quran. Allah says, بَعْدَ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ الذين آتيناهم الكتاب الذين الذين آتيناهم الكتاب يعرفونه كما يعرفون أبناءهم وإن فريقا منهم لا يكتمون الحق وهم يعلمون. Which can be translated to mean the people of the book know this as they know their own sons. But some of them conceal the truth, which they themselves know. Now, if you can see my cursor, I want to highlight for you this little pronoun here. If you look up the tafsir of this ayah, you're going to find that the pronoun here is the part that needs explaining. And this group here, al ladina atina kitab is obviously the Jews and Christians. But they seem to know something about this pronoun, and they know it so well, they know it like their own sons. 
and some of them are hiding what they know. So in the tafsir, you'll find that this is generally means the prophet Muhammad here, that he's the who here that's being referred to that they know. But I'm going to show you tonight that they know more than that. Not only do they know our prophet, وسلم, and they should have known him very well, but they know Islam, they know Allah, they know so many things about our religion. They know the Quran even. And when it, all of these signs came to them, it should have been beyond obvious. But keep in mind who it would have been beyond obvious for. It would have been beyond obvious for a certain group of them who have knowledge. The lay Christian, the lay Jew, you know, it's, I'm not going to say it's uh, permissible that they didn't, <laughs> they didn't see the prophet for who he was, alayhi salatu islam, but the rabbis, the priests, the learned members of their community, they definitely knew better. So tonight we all have to learn the Hebrew alphabet, because if we're going to find out for sure that they knew the truth, then we need to be able to go to their scriptures, and we cannot go to their scriptures simply by relying on translations. We need to go directly to the languages that they were revealed in. So everyone knows this letter. What is this letter here? Aleph. Aleph. Okay. And this is what it looks like in Hebrew. And guess what? It's pronounced exactly the same way. Aleph. You're going to have to learn about seven letters tonight. I don't think that's too much. There's seven days in the week. The next letter I want you all to see, what is this letter? Ba. Well, in Hebrew, it's, it's macharij, or macharij is the same place, ba. But the name of the letter is, is called bet, bet. What's this letter? Jean. Is that how I would pronounce it if I was in Egypt? No, Gim. <laughs> Gim, right? Now, it's, it's important that you, you know that. Also, if you're uh, in uh, Sudan, you'll probably do the same thing. This is its equivalent in Hebrew that I'm circling right here, the third letter from the top. It's actually pronounced Gemel. Now, why would Hebrew pronounce the G or the J sound as a G? Could it be because they were slaves in Egypt for 400 years? Mm. Perhaps because if you're a Yemeni Jew, you pronounce this as Jemel. So there's proof that the original pronunciation was probably a Jeh sound, but because so many of the Israelites were imprisoned in Egypt for so long, it became Ga. And it's like we said, today, even in Egypt, the Jim becomes a Gim. The next letter is Dal, and in Hebrew, it's Dalit, same, same Makhraj, Dal. Okay, these four letters, you need to know them. And then we're going to skip the next letters and we're going to go all the way to the bottom to this letter right here. I'm um, sorry, my screen. There we go. So what's this letter? When I teach young children this letter, I tell them this is the letter that you can only learn to pronounce if you run around the masjid four times. <laughs> it's the letter ha. It's equivalent in Hebrew is the one next to it. I don't know why this thing won't uh, disappear. There we go. So it looks a lot like dal or dalit in Hebrew, but it's got an extra leg. Well, turns out that when the Zionist, um, uh, the Zionists decided to uh, invade Palestine and turn it into the modern day secular nation state of Israel, when they revived Hebrew as a spoken language, because it had pretty much died out, they decided to use the Ashkenazi pronunciation of the Hebrew alphabet, which is what we call the European Jewish pronunciation, which had become corrupted. So they no longer pronounce this letter as ha. They pronounce it as chet. Um, if you guys don't mind uh, muting your microphones, um, I would appreciate it. So this letter 
Chet today is what's used in uh-huh. modern day Hebrew. So what's interesting about that is there's already a letter in Hebrew called Cha. So they have two ch sounds. So when you listen to Israel, Israelis talk to each other, you hear like everything they say because they're actually <clears throat> mispronouncing the letter. That letter should be pronounced as het. I know this because I sat with a rabbi and he taught me. Okay, so the four letters at the top and the letter at the bottom. Um, all of you should have received a link to the PDF to this so you could use these. Okay, the only other letter you have to learn on here is this letter right here, which is mim in Hebrew. Uh, mim in Arabic and in Hebrew, it's mim. So there's not a big difference there. Um, and then this letter, lam, which we know in Hebrew is lemed, lemed, same pronunciation. Once you've uh, grasped these, I think we did seven letters, yeah. Five, six, seven. That's all you need to know for the rest of my presentation. Okay, so here's an opportunity for you to try to use your Hebrew. Remember, Hebrew, just like Arabic, is ri- written left to right. I mean, I'm sorry, right to left. So here we have the letter Aleph, and we have the letter Lamed, and we have the name of God in ancient Hebrew, El. Okay. Now, I don't know how many of you have gone down the terrible rabbit hole I have of evangelical Zionist Christian YouTube videos talking about Islam, but you often find them using this argument that Allah and the God of Israel are not the same God. Okay. Maybe you've heard this. I don't know. Um, And what I've brought you here today is an argument that not only is that ridiculous and untrue, it is profoundly untrue. And anyone who just knows basic information about how the name of God is pronounced in other languages would immediately, the alarm bells would go off. So here is the name of God pronounced in Hebrew, Aramaic, the language that Isa, Jesus spoke, and Hebrew. And all of these names transliterated into Hebrew, except for obviously the one that's in Hebrew. Do you notice anything about all of these names? They all have exactly the same consonants. Aleph, Lamed, and I didn't choose this letter for you to learn, but hey, Aleph, Lamed, hey. The only difference, what we call in Arabic, teshkil, vowel markings. Like, they, you know, we have fetha, they have petha in, in Hebrew for the ah sound. So <clears throat> there's a slight pronunciation difference, and that's totally natural. Just like in the United States, we have people in New York City who say, let's get in the ka, <clears throat> let's get in the ka and go to Walmart, right? And then we have people in the South who say, let's get in the car and go to Walmart. So ka and car are the same automobile, but there's a slight pronunciation difference. Okay, enough of all the language stuff. Now let's get into the meat of this. If that were true, well then we would all, all we'd have to do is go to a Christian Arab and ask them, do you find the name Allah in your Bible? And here we have the Bible, in fact, the first book, the Bible, which Jews and Christians consider sacred scripture, the book of Genesis. And here is the very first paragraph from an Arab Christian Bible. Pretty basic Arabic sentence there. In the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. And then I think one, two, three, four, five, six more times in just the first paragraph, it's clear and it's beyond obvious that it's the same God. But, you know, I think we can do better than that. Any of you ever stayed in a hotel? If you ever stayed in a hotel in the United States, get in your bed and open the dresser drawer next to your bed and you'll find in it something called a Gideon Bible. The Gideon Society, much like the organization I work for, for Khan Project, 
produces billions of Bibles and puts them in hotels all over the country. And inside of there, they boast that the Bible has been translated into so many different languages, but they bring you about 40 languages that they've translated in. They take their favorite verse from John uh, chapter uh, 3, verse 16, which is, um, for God so loved the world. They always hold it up at soccer games and football games. And here is that verse, because one of the first languages they boast that the Bible's been translated into is Arabic, because it's at the beginning of the alphabet. And here you have, لِأَنَّهُ هَكَذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ الْعَالَمُ that because God so ha so loved the world, and of course circled in red, is clear and plain as day, the word Allah. I wonder how many of these evangelical churches, these Zionist Christian churches who say that Allah is a different God than the God of Israel, have invested money in the Gideon Bible Society, the same Bible Society who is telling us without any ambiguity whatsoever that Allah is the God of Israel and the God of Jesus. And if it weren't plain and clear enough, well, the Quran already told us. Allah says in Surah Al-Ankabut, بَعْدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَلَا تُجَادِلُ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْهُمْ Do not argue with Jews and Christians except in a way that is best except for those who have committed injustices among them. Tell them, we believe in that which has been revealed to us and to you. And our God and your God are the same God. Subhanallah. So not only does the Quran say this, but Arab Christians confirm it, that يَعْرِفُونَهُ They know Allah كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاهُمْ Just like they know their own children. Now, this gave me goosebumps when I first learned it. Not only do they know Allah, but they know the theology of Allah, His sifat. So, this, what you're looking at on the screen, is what we call the Shahada for Jews. Okay, like we have our Shahada, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. We're supposed to say it every day. We say it in every prayer. If you're on your deathbed, La Qadr Allah, someone will come to the hospital and tell you to keep repeating this over and over and over because we all want to die saying this. May Allah make us people who die with Kalimat uh, Tawheed upon our lips and in our hearts. Allahumma Amin. But this is the equivalent in Judaism. This is called the Shema. Um, it's roughly pronounced something like Shema Yisrael Adunai Eloheinu Adunai Echad, which means, listen, children of Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. Okay? That's the thing they have to say every morning when they wake up, every night before they go to sleep, if they're on their deathbed. It's in the Torah. It's a very, very clear statement. Every Jewish person says this. Okay? Now, what we have at the bottom of the screen is Surah Al-Ikhlas. Surah Al-Ikhlas, uh, I don't know that there's any Muslim on earth that doesn't know this, unless you just took your Shahada like a week ago. But this Surah starts off with the phrase, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Asbab and Nuzul, the reasons for revelation, but there are uh, what they say, قولين, two opinions about why this ayah was revealed. All right, so I'll know that the vast majority of the Quran, we have uh, a lot of information about the particular incident in which this set of verses or the set of ayat or the set of the surah came down. The first opinion that most of you probably know is that the mushrikeen of Mecca, the polytheists of Mecca, they asked the Prophet Sallallahu well, who is Allah? Like, tell us about Allah. Because obviously they worship idols. So they want to know, well, you know, who is this idol that you worship? Or who is this God that you have? 
um, tell us the theology. Of course, they all knew who Allah was, but they didn't know him like we know him as Muslims. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the other opinion, and this is the one I'm going to um, use for tonight, is that it was actually the rabbis of Medina. So uh, imagine you're all these rabbis, you're living in Yathrib, north of Mecca. You're there, obviously, because you think a new prophet is going to come. I mean, everyone knows that backstory. And suddenly you hear that there's a man in Mecca, south of you, who's claiming to be a prophet. And he's reciting verses about the children of Israel and about Musa, alayhi salam, Moses. And he's talking about all these things. The first thing you're going to want to know is, does he worship the same God we worship? I mean, that's the first thing that's going to come to your mind. If he's a real messenger, then he should at least know the proper theology. So, of course, Allah reveals in the most beautiful and concise way possible who he is. He says, say, O Allah, ahad. Now, a couple things I want to point out to you in Arabic here. Let's ignore this first command verb here, first person command verb here, say, and just focus on these three words here, huwa, Allahu, and ahad. This is generally translated as say he is Allah, who is, who is one, okay? But I want to point out some interesting facts to you all. Number one, huwa is just a pronoun to use in substitute for the uh, ismul jalal, like Allah's name. Okay, so if you get tired of saying Allah, 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 and you want to just use a pronoun, you use huwa, okay? But, you know, laysa kamithlihi shay, Allah is not male or female, right? This is just a, a phenomenon of the Arabic language that it happens to be a, a male personal pronoun. Um, still, nonetheless, it's, it seems kind of strange to, to use the word he for Allah, right? Because we know Allah doesn't have a gender. So some grammarians have, you know, um, said things like, well, huwa is actually like a name for Allah also. It's the pronoun to use in place of the name of, of, of Allah, but it's also sort of like a name. And then Allah is, of course, the name of God, right? But it also means the God as well. So it's, it has a specific and a general form, okay? So actually what you have here are, I guess you could say, khabarain, uh, two khabar, two subjects in a sentence, and one predicate, okay? This can be read, he is Allah, one. It could also mean, he is God, one. Now, why do I say that? Because I want you to look at this Shema that we talked about in the beginning. What is it basically saying? Well, it has a command verb at the beginning here, whereas ours has the command verb say, and then the people being addressed, Israel, and then the theological statement, which is the Lord is God, the Lord is one. Look at this last word here. Aleph in Hebrew, het, which remember Jews mispronounced today in Israel as het, and dalit. What's that say? Ahad, just like in Arabic. In fact, pronounced exactly the same way. In other words, Allah took the theological statement that every Jew knows by heart. And then he made it in a very beautiful and concise way in Arabic. Instead of having to repeat the Lord twice, he just said that he is God one, which is basically the same exact statement. In other words, what the prophet, what was revealed to him to say to them would have gone right into their hearts. They would have been like, oh, we, he, are, he knows exactly who God is, right? So Ya'rifunahu, not only do they know Allah, they know the theology of Allah. Kama ya'rifuna abnahu. Just like they know their own sons because they teach all of their sons to say this phrase. SubhanAllah. Okay, now we're going to watch a video. Let me know if you don't hear the audio very well.
no no audio on our end. Did somebody say something? Yeah, the audio I'm is not getting the audio. Oh, there's no audio. Mm. Yeah, no audio. Let me try to open this video up on YouTube and see if that changes it. If not, then we'll have to do without the video tonight. Let me see here. Uh, I'm sorry about the technical problems, guys. Just bear with me. That was the name of the video. Yeah, here is absolute truth. All right, Bismillah, hopefully this will work. No, this is not what I'm looking for. This is not what I was looking for. Well, I thought this was going to be a lot easier to find. Let's see. Videos. Uh, just try uh, Muhammad in Bible. Uh, I, I think it's going to help you. I think this is the one I'm looking for. It seems to have Arabic subtitles. Okay, do you all hear that? Negative. Hmm, I'm very sorry about this, guys. Anyone familiar with um, Zoom that knows maybe what I'm doing wrong here? I think if you do uh, select your uh, microphone and say same as system in the bottom left, you can see if that helps. Me. Show small active speaker video. It should say on the le bottom left, it should say under microphone, same as system. You see that option? Uh, in, in the sound system, system. Uh, can't say sorry. Is it is it part of Zoom that I'm I need to look into or yeah, part of my computer? Yeah, it's on your Zoom uh, as an option. Um, when you select the microphone icon, how do I get out of displaying my screen? Uh, at the top, it should be a little bar for Zoom. Where you should be or one of the brothers just linked the video in the chat, so we could just watch it from tomorrow. Okay. Uh, you... Okay, I'll try to have my audio problem solved next time we have a lesson. I'm really sorry, guys. I apologize about that. I know that's annoying when the presenter doesn't have everything together. <laughs> that's okay. So what we can do then is this. I'll just explain the video. So in the video, if, if you guys could meet your microphones, I'd appreciate it. I keep hearing someone's a van going off. So in this video, um, what happens is, please, if you don't mind, mute, mute, everyone, please mute your uh, speaker or your uh, microphone. Oh, boy. Or just turn off your phone, it's making the other, <laughs> whatever. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's a book in the Tanakh, which is the 
main scripture for the Jewish community. And it's also a sacred scripture for the Christian community. They call it the Old Testament. It's called the Song of Songs. And it is a book that is allegedly attributed to Solomon at Ayy Salaam. And in this book, you find a um, chapter number five, which it's supposed to be like a love story or like a love poem some woman writing about a man. Um, so some people will say it's one of Solomon's wives writing about Solomon. Some people will say it's a metaphor for the church's love for Jesus. It just depends on which religious tradition you ask. And in it, there is a description of a man. And this man that's being talked about has all these attributes but at the end it says that his mouth is most sweet he is altogether lovely this is my beloved this is my friend O daughters of jerusalem so the argument made in the video which i'll i'll link it in the uh in the whatsapp group so that you can all watch it later is that the name of the person there being mentioned is the name of our prophet but what's happening is when it's translated into english they're translating the meaning of the name now, this is pretty easy for you and I to understand. If we take any name in Arabic, doesn't matter. I mean, I, can't, I can hardly think of any names that are so, also aren't descriptive of some quality, okay? So, you know, Asad is a name, but it's also a lion, for example. Uh, we can think of other names like Muhammad. Muhammad is a name, but it also has a meaning that means like uh, praiseworthy, okay? So what's happening is that when these, this verse is translated, it's not being considered a name here. It's being considered an adjective. And so they're saying, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend of daughters of Jerusalem. But the word in Hebrew, and it's here on the screen highlighted, is the letter mem, het, mem, Dalit, and then there is what's called a plural ending on it, im in Hebrew, which can be used for all kinds of reasons. It can be used to make something plural, so more than one in number. It can also be used in ancient Hebrew to give a name a higher respect, like to elevate the status of that name, right? It's kind of similar. It's not exactly the same in Hebrew. Um, they used to call Abraham Abram. But then when he became the messenger of God, he became Abraham. okay? So this plural ending at the end is not necessarily part of the original um, words or the, the uh, original root of the name. It's just added on there to give the name like elevated in the sentence, give it more emphasis. So What we're going to do is we're going to show you, in fact, that is exactly the name of the Prophet Muhammad. First thing we're going to do is we're going to look at this passage to make sure that this is actually talking about our Prophet. So here's the passage in question. This is chapter 5, uh, and this is verses um, 10 through 16, talking about a man in the Song of Solomon. It says, firstly, my beloved is radiant and ruddy. Another way of translating that is red and white. Now, if you look at the Shema'il, the, the description of Imam at tirmidhi of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that he was neither pasty white, nor was he like really dark skinned like an African. He is in the middle, white and ruddy or white and red. Outstanding amongst 10,000. Remember when our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walked into Mecca to conquer it, he was followed by 10,000 of his companions. His head is purest gold, and his hair is wavy. In the Shema'il of Imam Tirmidhi, when I believe Imam Ali radiallahu an is describing our Prophet's hair, he said his hair was ne neither um, straight, nor was it curly, like, um, like you could say like African hair, but it was in the middle, it was wavy. Then it goes on to say, I'll skip down, 
to here, that his mouth is sweetness itself. Now I want you all to remember from the descriptions of our prophet's behavior is that he used to brush his teeth constantly, all the time. In fact, he said Allah Islam left this world in the arms of his beloved wife Aisha radiallahu anha, brushing his teeth with miswak. They said that we count, we could we lost count of how many times a day we saw him brushing his teeth because he always wanted to have a beautiful smell coming out of his mouth. Then the sentence in question, he is altogether lovely. Now let's go to the Hebrew and look at that phrase. So here's Song of Songs in Hebrew. And look here, we have Muhammadim, just like I pronounced it, because you see the letter Mim, Het, Mim, Dalit. That's exactly how you would pronounce it in Arabic, okay? The only difference is we would say Muhammad, and they say Muhammad, okay? So there's just a slight pronunciation difference. And notice they're giving the English definition here lovely because they're saying this is an adjective, not a proper name, although it's described here as a noun. Okay, so let's go to Google Translate and see what happens. So we're gonna take this name, we're gonna copy it, and we're gonna go to Google Translate and we're gonna say, Google Translate. Let's see what you got for us. Sorry, I gotta switch the languages. Now, two years ago when I did this, it very clearly and unambiguously showed up as Muhammad. Today, it shows up as the random word allowed. I don't know what happened two years ago because for years I used to do this live in front of people. And I'll prove it to you by showing you me doing this presentation at the Islamic Association of Raleigh. So you can see that I'm not joking when I say that for many, many years this worked out fine. <laughs> Why is that? There we go. So right now I'm copying Mimhet Mimdalit from the screen live at the Islamic Association of Raleigh, 2017. Same thing, Google Translate. Now I'm going to paste it in there. Oh, and there we go. That's what it used to do for years and years and years. When I went to Google Translate, it came up clear as day. And then all of a sudden, in 2018, no more. So there, that's there for everyone to go watch. Um, if you wanna hear the audio later, I'll post it. This is Signs of Islam, Previous Scriptures, and that's at the Islamic Association of Raleigh in 2017. Okay, so I've done my best to show uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is talking about our prophet. It's certainly talking about a man. It's certainly talking about a man with wavy hair who's neither too dark or too pasty white. Uh, it's describing the aspects of our prophet, chief of 10,000 men, a uh, beautiful smell coming out of his mouth. And he's definitely um, the beloved of the children of Israel if they had accepted him. And of course, Abdullah ibn Salam, uh, radiallahu anh, definitely did, and he was the chief rabbi of Medina. So, Back to the presentation. How much time do we have left? Okay, so we still have 20 minutes and I wanna leave a little bit of time for question. Uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about is a prophecy in the Torah. So we said, Ya'rifuna who? They know our prophet like they know their own children. And now we're gonna look at some prophecies. So in the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, there is a prophecy. And I want you to take note of what's being said here. Moses is talking to the children of Israel, and all of a sudden he begins to speak the words of God, okay, just like our prophet would. And he says to them, I will raise up for them, the children of Israel, a prophet like you, O Moses, from amongst their brethren, which is like the word ach in Hebrew, similar to this word in Arabic. And it says, and I've highlighted here, I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. Now ask yourself a question here. Does the Prophet وسلم, speak from himself? No, the Quran says very clearly he doesn't speak from his hawa. Everything is wahi yuha, 
It's revealed to him to say. And we, we call the entire Quran Kalamullah. It's not the prophet's speech. It's literally God putting his words in the mouth of the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he, did he hide certain commands from us of the, in the Sharia? No. It says that he will tell them everything I command. Think about how many command verbs are in the, in the Quran. Just think of the word Qul. Qul is in the Quran so many times. This is a command. And then it's a command for you to do something or to say something. So he told us all the commands. And then it goes on to say in uh, verse number 19, and I myself will call to account anyone who doesn't listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. Is there anything that the prophet did not do except that he did it in the name of Allah? I mean, every single surah of the Quran starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, except Surah Tawbah. Uh, one opinion is because uh, Surah Anfal and Surah Tawbah used to be considered one surah, and that's why there's no Basmala. And then there's other opinions that say Allah is angry at uh, the Mushrikeen, and so he doesn't put the Basmala at the beginning of that chapter. But that's another story. So he speaks in the name of God, in the name of Allah. He cut a piece of fruit, he would say Bismillah. He would say Bismillah when he entered his house. He would say Bismillah when he came into the masjid. He would say Bismillah for so many things. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything that I command, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. So <clears throat> this is one of the main reasons people try to discredit our prophet today from amongst the people of the book and say that he's talking about another god not the God of the children of Israel, which we showed beyond a shadow of a doubt. And there's no way that there's anything else that he's talking about except the God of the children of Israel. And even down to the theology that they believe in. And then it goes on to say that he should be put to death. Now you understand why the Jews wanted to kill him, because if they killed him, that would prove to them that he could not have been a prophet. You may say to yourselves, how will we know that the message... Um, has not been spoken by the Lord. So how do we know that this prophet is actually lying? He's not speaking in uh, things that you've given him. And then he goes on to say, if what the prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. In other words, if he says a prophecy about the future and it doesn't come true, then he's not a prophet. I mean, this is pretty self-explanatory. So that particular portion we're going to prove in week number four of this Sira lecture series. Uh, so just put that one on the back burner. We want to show very clearly that everything the prophet spoke about did come true. So we can see clearly that Moses was told that there was going to be someone who would come after him who would be like him. Right? Moses got married, the Prophet ﷺ got married. Moses had children, the Prophet ﷺ had children. Moses came with a sacred law, the Torah. The Prophet ﷺ came with the Sharia of Islam. Uh, Moses established a nation-state kingdom of the children of Israel. The Prophet ﷺ established a nation-state of Islam. Uh, I mean, we're kind of you know, back-projecting the word nation-state here, but you know what I mean. A, a religio-social-economic system. Well, I mean, we could go on and on and on uh, seeing the parallels between Moses and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Now, let's get to what Christians would know about the future. So in the Christian Gospels, as they have them today, there is a book called John. This is probably most Christians' favorite book of the Bible uh, because it has all their favorite statements that they like to use to prove that Jesus is more than a man and more than the Messiah and more than a prophet. We all know what they say about him. At the beginning of that book, we have Yahya salam, John the Baptist. And he is a prophet out in the wilderness outside of Israel. And he has a bunch of disciples, Hawariyun, you could say. And the Jewish rabbis, they come to him because they want to know who he is. So it says, now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. And he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. In other words, he told them very clearly who he was. He began by saying, I am not the Messiah. 
So we can cross that off the list. John the Baptist, yeah, yeah, was not the Messiah. They asked him, then, who are you? Are you Elijah? So Elijah was a prophet who apparently never died. He just was assumed into heaven by God. And he was supposed to come back near the end of time and give the good news of the coming of the Messiah, al Messiah, Isa alayhi salam. To which John responded, Yahya responded, I am not. Then they ask a very important question. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Who is this talking about? Well, when you go to a uh, concordance of the Bible, you'll find that this is referring to the prophecy we just looked at in Deuteronomy here. In other words, there were three people during the time of Jesus that the Jews were looking for. Firstly, the Messiah, which we all know is Jesus. Next, Elijah, which turns out Jesus identifies John the Baptist as Elijah later on in the same book. Okay, he says that he actually is. He was the one that came to tell people about the Messiah. And of course, that's what Yahya did. He proclaimed the coming of the Messiah for everyone. But nowhere in the Christian Gospels do you find this third person, the prophet, because they're making a distinction here between the Messiah and the one mentioned in Deuteronomy. Well, all Christians will tell you that, that this prophecy is talking about Jesus here. And no doubt it's describing Jesus pretty well. Jesus spoke the words of God. He spoke in the name of God. Um, he prophesied about the future, because this can be generally applied to any prophet. But they seem to be looking for a specific person who was not the Messiah, but was a new prophet to come. And so this is an interesting statement that the New Testament has about our prophet. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to get into this next prophecy until next week. So at this point, I'm going to just uh, give you a preview of what's coming up. We're going to be talking about another prophecy in the New Testament that clearly describes our prophet in a beautiful way. And then we're going to be talking about the Hajj pilgrimage. Um, and this thing blows my mind. When I learned about this, like my faith in Islam went through the roof. So that will be next Wednesday, inshallah, starting at 8.30 p.m., We'll kick into these, these two parts. And then module two will be complete. Okay? There'll be no more stuff about before the prophet, said Allah Islam. There will only be stuff about the prophet's actual life for module two. So that'll start on Thursday next week, inshallah. And then uh, after about three weeks, maybe four weeks, we'll get to module three, which is talking about after the prophet's life Islam. So I hope at the very least, some of the things that you learned tonight increased your faith by letting you know that even before the Prophet Islam ever showed up and brought us the Islam that we practice today, the people of the book were already anticipating this to come. And that they already worshiped the God that we worshiped. Uh, they had the name of that God already, but the theology at the very least is the same. And that when the Prophet Islam came, he was very clear and unambiguous of them about his theology and who he was. And finally, that the name of the prophet himself pronounced exactly the way you would pronounce it in Arabic is mentioned in the Bible clearly with a very, very, very good description of him and some of the things that happened in his life. And you can go deeper and deeper into that passage and find more things. Um, I highly recommend you all talk, uh, check out Dr. Ali Atai. Um, on YouTube. He has a very, very wonderful lecture entitled, Is Allah the God of the, God of the Bible? And he gets into this deeply, much more deeply than I did tonight. I just kind of grazed over it, where he shows like so much evidence is unbelievable, but in a really academic way, uh, because he's a professor in a college and way more learned than a layman like myself. So I'll open the floor if you have any questions. We have about uh, nine more minutes. Assalamu alaikum, I had Thank one question. Uh, one, so I actually had a couple Christian uh, friends. I still do. I still keep in touch with them. Um, there's actually another verse in the Bible. I don't know if you know. It's like, I think in John and says like, I have spoken while still with you. And then that's next week. You're, okay. you're, you're, you're uh, jumping okay. to next week. Okay. 
Okay, Wednesday yeah. next week we'll talk about that prophecy. We'll talk about that. And uh, I guess the second question I had is a lot of Christians, when they talk about, say that, um, uh, what do you call it? I lost my train of thought. Um, that the messenger that they sent would be uh, like a, the Messiah, right? So when they talk about the Messiah, they always reference to Jesus. And they said, and Jesus says in, in the Bible that whoever comes after me and preaches would be a, like, would be a false prophet. So do not follow him. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, Jesus does mention in the New Testament that there will be many false prophets who come after me. Right. Okay. And they say, you know, we saw the Messiah here. We saw the Messiah here, uh, there. We saw the Messiah in the desert. Actually, what's fascinating about that prophecy is it fits St. Paul to a T. So St. Paul, he, there's 27 books in the New Testament. St. Paul writes most of them, or, or they're at least attributed to him. Uh, although some of them uh, may be um, pseudonymous, like they used his name, but actually he didn't write them. But nonetheless, uh, Paul's a very central figure in Christianity and in the New Testament. And Paul claims to have seen the Messiah on the road to Dam Damascus, Damascus in Syria, which is in the desert. And Jesus specifically mentions false prophets who will say that they saw the Messiah in the desert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you all something about uh, denial. You know, if you really want to deny something, you can come up with a million reasons why you, you will not accept that something is, is true. To the extent that you can take someone outside and you can say, look, there's the sun and you can point to the sun and they'll stick their hand up in front of their face and say, no, there's, there's no sun there. And then you grab their arm and you're like, well, you know, if you just move your arm, you'll see it. And then they're like, no, 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 there's, there's no sun. I don't see any sun because they willfully want to suppress. They have, it's like if there's a multiple choice answer list and Muhammad is a prophet is one of the answers. Like they remove that off the list. Like it, it's not even possible for them that he could be a messenger. And so they will make every possible excuse in their mind while none of the things that you tell them could be talking about our messenger. Right. And that's why, you know, this class, I don't give it to Christians. I give it to Muslims because you guys already know that he's the messenger of God. All this is going to do is confirm it for you even more, right. which is the point. I would only show these things to a Christian if that person, you know, entertained the possibility that Muhammad is a messenger of God. But just to go out in the street and stop random Christians and tell them this stuff, like it's not going to affect them. Because like I said, for many of them, it's, it's impossible that our prophet is a messenger of God. Right. Um, it's, and, and, and it's just, it would be the same as like some Qadiani coming to you guys tonight and saying that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is the Messiah. Right. Like you're just not even going to entertain that idea. You're going to be like, no, we know who the Messiah is. You know, it's Jesus. And right. <laughs> we know that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is not a messenger because the Quran says Khatim and Nabiyin or Khatim and Nabiyin. The seal of the prophet. Yeah, that he's no prophet coming after him. So don't even get that out of here. <laughs> right. And uh, one quick question I had, uh, I don't know if it's related to this subject, but um, when they talk about prophecies in terms of wahi, is it is it possible that, because dreams are one aspect of the revelation which is left in, 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 in the rest of, you know, mankind, is it, is because uh, I feel like a lot of what people have predicted, which were not prophets, obviously, which were more like spiritual leaders and things like that, um, came true, and that and that's why they got a huge amount of following. Is that is that still the case? Is prophet are prophecies revealed through um, like things such as dreams, because that is it is, it is a form of wahi. I'll just try to give a brief answer to this. Um, any believer can have true dreams. Um, and near the end of time, the Prophet Sallam mentioned that believers will, will constantly have true dreams. Okay? okay. And dreams generally require interpreting um, because they're very symbolic. It's not the literal thing that you see in the dream, but the dream 
um, symbolically tells you something. Um, but that doesn't make you a prophet. It's just an aspect of prophecy, right? A prophet is more than just someone who talks about the future. Um, so that's, that's my short answer and Alana's best. Okay, I just wanna say something briefly because the meeting's about to end. If you have any questions and you didn't get a chance to ask, and that's probably most of you, post them in the WhatsApp group and I will answer them at my leisure between now and next Wednesday, okay? Because uh, I wanna make sure you get your answers. Okay. If you found tonight's lecture difficult, uh, the fact that I couldn't play the video was annoying, please forgive me. I will do a be much better job next week. I realized that tonight's lecture was very technical and you were like, ah, I don't want to learn Hebrew. The rest of the series is not going to be like this. Um, it's just something you have to do in the very beginning in order to access the original languages just so I can show you clearly that I'm not making up these pronunciations of Hebrew, but they are in fact the way these things sound. Um, uh, I, I promise you the rest of this series will not be so um, technical. Um, so if that was annoying and the audio problem was annoying, please forgive me. It will be better next time, inshallah. And please make dua for me. Uh, we'll end with a dua. Allahumma inna nas'aluka bi anna laka alhamd ya hanan ya badi wa samawati wal ard ya dal jalali wal ikram ya hayu ya qayyum. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa baraka ala sayyidina wa habibina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتوب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم ربنا زدنا علما اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه Last but not least, this entire presentation was brought to you tonight by Forcon Project. We are the largest distributor of English and Spanish translations of the Quran in the country. We give them to prisons, hospitals, hotels, and dorm rooms throughout the United States and have done so for about 17 years now. If you all wanna do something really good, and as one of my teachers said, you should never sit down in a dars just to listen and learn something without it becoming amal in your life. Even if it means you just go and pray an extra two raka'at because you learned something new, go to the Forkan website and make a donation. When you donate to us, you are sponsoring Quran that we will distribute on your behalf. And we do this because we want non-Muslims to get the beautiful revelation of the Quran. I will post a link to donating in the WhatsApp group. Uh, for example, you can donate $104 and it's like sponsoring 52 translations that we will give out to a hospital or a prison on your behalf. And every one of these that ends up in the hands of a non-Muslim is a chance for them to get this message and anything good they do from your donation, you get the reward for it. And Alhamdulillah, I would not be a Muslim today if 11 years ago, someone did not give me the English translation of the Quran. So it definitely works to help people receive guidance. So please consider doing that. Also, you can go to our uh, other website, sendaquran.com. If you have a neighbor, classmate, coworker, customer, or patient, and you'd like to make sure that they have the revelation, you can send it to them. All you do is pay the shipping and handling, and we take care of the rest. The Quran is free for them. And this is a great way for you to help someone you know who's got a lot of free time right now, like the rest of us. I can sit down and really dive into this book. And we ask a lot to guide all of us and to guide them. I will see you all next Wednesday, 8.30 sharp. Jazakallah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> وانتشت روحي وصارت دمع يجري